Hi, you guys. Welcome back. I am Professor Daniel, your favorite uh, history professor, and I am back with Chapter 5. Um, just a few announcements before I get started. So, for one, if uh, on your assignments, if it says that there's a 10-sentence minimum, please make sure you write at least 10 sentences. Uh, if you don't, you will not get full credit. Also, um, we are in Texas. The deadline to register to vote is October 5th. So if you can register to vote and I will put information on your online learning platform so you guys will have all of the information you need. Okay, so chapter five covers about 20 years of information and it all really culminates around the Revolutionary War. I really enjoyed learning about the Revolutionary War um, growing up, and I really loved teaching about the Revolutionary War. However, in this chapter, I want us to go a little deeper. I want us to not just talk about the actual war, but one, we're gonna learn about why there, you know, why is war an option anyways? What is the issue? What's the crisis? We're also going to look at, is it, is it one issue or is it one revolution or are there many revolutions? So we'll look into all of that. So as we start chapter five, I want to give you guys just a little bit of a recap. We ended chapter four talking about the French and Indian War, also known as the Seven Years War, that's fought between two European empires, the French and the British. The British end up winning, and at the end, their treaty that they sign with each other leads to France essentially ceding their mainland North American colonies. And so you have really one main um, European empire that is on this North American continent or mainland North America, continental America, I'll call it. Um, and that will be the English. Yeah, the, Spani the Spanish still have a stronghold, but they're not as much as a world power by the time we get to the 18th century, okay? So after the French and Indian War, um, while Britain ends up uh, getting some uh, territory, the issue is that war is expensive and they're left with enormous, almost crippling debt. And so in order to try to solve this issue with debt, they look to the colonies and they say, well, well, the colonies can share in the cost of war by taxes. And so they begin to tax the colonies because it's Parliament's attempt to raise money directly through the colonies rather than indirectly through trade. And so one of the first acts that they'll have is the Revenue Act which says that goods such as wool and hides have to be shipped through England. Now, this is going to be an issue to a lot of colonists because if you're a colonial merchant and that's what you're trying to sell, it directly impacts you. Next, we'll talk about the Stamp Act, and the Stamp Act is a big one. So the Stamp Act of 1765 stated that all printed materials made in the colonies had to carry a stamp that was purchased from British authorities. Now, the big issue is not necessarily about being taxed. The colonists have been taxed in the past. However, this is a direct tax and it's passed without colonial consent. It's after the Stamp Act is passed in 1765 that we'll start to see the colonists really jump back. And from here to really the end of this chapter, we'll really kind of see this kind of volleying action between the colonists and Great Britain. Whenever Great Britain does something, the colonists will do something in reaction. And then the colonists will do something and Great Britain with the ball now will do something in reaction. So after Great Britain, uh, after Parliament passes the Stamp Act of 1765 without colonial consent, in October of that same year, the Stamp Act Congress meets in New York. And they say, it, hey, as colonists, as British subjects, as Englishmen and women, we should enjoy the same rights as residents of Britain. Now, this is important because it also demonstrates that these colonists don't see themselves as Americans. We don't have a holy or purely American identity yet. They view themselves as Englishmen. And because of that, a lot, the initial response from many people is not independence, it's reconciliation. 
And so in an attempt to get this uh, Stamp Act repealed, they will directly fight the, st uh, the Stamp Act. Colonists will decide to boycott. Uh, opponents of the Stamp Act took to the streets and destroyed shipments of stamps. And these crowds would easily get out of hand. And Parliament heard them. Uh, they, in 1766, Parliament will repeal the Stamp Act. However, once they repeal the Stamp Act, they'll also respond with something called the Declaratory Act. The Declaratory Act essentially stated that Parliament possessed the power to pass laws for the colonies and the people of America in all cases. Now, this is an issue because opponents to the Stamp Act said the issue here is that as subjects really of Britain, as British citizens, I would say, you're taxing us but we don't have any representation in Parliament. So the rallying cry after the Stamp Act is no taxation without representation because these colonists don't have any sort of representation in Parliament. So after the Stamp Act, we also have another act that is passed or another series of taxes that are passed known as the Townsend Acts or the Townsend Duties. These were taxes that were put on goods that were imported into the colonies. It also created a new board of customs commissioners to make sure these taxes were collected. In response to this, um, a man by the name of John Dickinson writes an article in a Pennsylvania newspaper called Letters from a Farmer in Pennsylvania. I really like mentioning this document because it illustrates the idea that one, People aren't seeking independence immediately. A lot of them want reconciliation. And this is what Dickinson will argue in letters from a farmer in Pennsylvania. He'll say, look, we want reconciliation with the mother country. We want to enjoy the rights of Englishmen instead of being seen as colonial subjects that don't have any rights. In an effort to continue this boycott, um, you have a lot of Americans who will be, or I'll say, I say Americans, but I'll say it's more accurate to call them colonial Americans because they don't view themselves as Americans yet. So these colonists, um, in an act of, I will say, resistance, begin to try to make their own things. They begin to rely on American goods or colonially produced goods uh, rather than depending on Great Britain to import goods to them. Um, women who began to make their own outfits and cloth and spinning their own cloth instead of getting it or importing it from Great Britain were known as the Daughters of Liberty. George Washington even mentions this idea of homespun virtue when he says Virginians could, quote, maintain the liberty which we have derived from our ancestors, end quote, while reducing their debt by making their own things, by lessening their reliance on Great Britain. So um, you have this idea of homespun virtue, that we can make our things, we can make our own things depend on colonial uh, products instead of having to purchase it from Great Britain. So we have all of this going on. We have a lot of colonial um, conflict here. You have some people or a lot of people who want reconciliation. We have British soldiers who are uh, situated in many colonies, including the Massachusetts colony, um, especially in Boston. Um, we have a lot of conflict. There's a lot of colonial conflict. We see this culmination of conflict occur in 1770 with the Boston Massacre. So in your PowerPoint, before you see any information on the Boston Massacre, you have this painting of the Boston Massacre, which shows a line of British uh, soldiers who are armed with muskets, who are surrounded by the plumes of smoke that's been given off by their firing muskets. And you see them firing into an unarmed crowd of bleeding, dying colonists. But what really happens during the Boston Massacre? The Boston Massacre is 
really, or it begins as a street fight, a street fight between Bostonians and British troops uh, that ends up growing into an armed confrontation. So you have these Bostonians who are picking up stones and sticks and whatever they can find, and they are throwing it at these uh, British soldiers who will eventually uh, fire on these colonists. The first person to be killed in the American Revolution uh, are the first people who are killed in the American Revolution. Um, it happens here during the Boston Massacre. Um, and our first martyr of the American Revolution is Crispus Attucks, which is a black man. He ends up being the first martyr of the American Revolution killed during the Boston Massacre. So a commanding officer for these British soldiers and eight of the soldiers are put on trial in Massachusetts, and they're actually defended by John Adams. Seven are found not guilty, and two are convicted on manslaughter. However, there are some consequences to the Boston Massacre. So for one, the Townsend duties are repealed, which is a score, I'd say, for the colonists. Two, they also, once the Townsend duties are repealed, it only leaves a tax tea. And the next thing is that they also agreed to remove British troops from Boston. So let's talk about this tea and this tax on tea. Why is tea so important? So during or by the time we get to the 18th century, tea is something that is consumed by all social classes in England and in the colonies. Think of tea as their coffee. The same way that we drink coffee is the way that they drink tea. Coffee is not very expensive and it's consumed by all social classes. The East India Company was a trading monopoly that governed British uh, possessions in India. Now with tea, the price of stock in tea collapsed. And so uh, Britain decided to bail out the East India Company by offering them rebate, rebates and tax exemptions. Um, the money that was raised, they continued, however, to tax this tea in the colonists and hoping that the money that would be raised by the taxation of the tea uh, would be used to defray the cost of colonial government. So we will use this tax that you have to pay to run colonial government. Well, after this, um, with the, the tax on tea, this ends up, again, we see the volleying action. Parliament will do something and the colonists will do something in response to it. So in December 1773, a group of colonists disguised themselves as Native, uh, Native Americans and they boarded three ships in Boston Harbor and they end up throwing about 300 chests of tea overboard. Now, what's the big deal about this tea? It's not the tea itself as much as it's the value of the tea. The loss amounted to more than $4 million in today's currency. So of course, Parliament is not going to let these colonists get away with that. So in response to the Boston Tea Party, Parliament will pass the Intolerable Acts also known as the Coercive Acts. I will use um, the name of these acts interchangeably, uh, but for the most part, I'll call them the uh, Intolerable Acts. So the Intolerable Acts are four parliamentary measures in reaction to the Boston Tea Party. So the first thing they had to do is repay for the tea. They had to uh, pay for the loss in tea. Two, the uh, parliament disallowed colonial trials of British soldiers. So remember what happened after the Boston Massacre and those uh, soldiers were put on trial in Massachusetts? Well, that wouldn't happen anymore. Three, it also forced the quartering of soldiers in private homes. And four, that it reduced the number of elected officials in Massachusetts. Now this is important because if we recall in a lot of colonies, the officials weren't actually elected, they were appointed. And so it gives you less of a voice. So in reaction to the intolerable acts, the colonists will come together and create something called, or form, I will say, the first Continental Congress in Philadelphia on September 5th, 1774. That is when you'll have the meeting of the first Continental Congress. And again, this was the colonial response uh, to the intolerable acts as uh, martial law had been declared in the land.
So the Continental Congress was the governing body that coordinated a resistance to the British before and during the Revolutionary War. Uh, during the war, the Continental Congress will serve as the de facto government. They will um, negotiate with foreign nations. They'll negotiate treaties and, and talk to different nations. Um, the Articles of Association they also, I will say, form the articles or create the articles of association. This says, or the articles of association state that if the intolerable acts are not repealed by December 1st, 1774, that the Americans or the colonial Americans rather will boycott British imports, okay? So this is what the Articles of Association state. They state that if these four parliamentary measures known as the Intolerable, Act, Intolerable Acts are not repealed by December 1, 1774, that the colonists were going to boycott British imports, meaning that they were no longer going to buy their goods from Great Britain. So they agreed to reconvene the following year, May 10th, 1775, if none of their um, demands had been met. It's during this first Continental Congress that Patrick Henry says something that is quite revolutionary. He states, and I quote, the distinction between Virginians, Pennsylvanians, New Yorkers, and New Englanders are no more. I am not a Virginian, but an American. So it's during this Continental Congress that you get a you get a group of colonists who um, start to identify themselves not necessarily as uh, British or Englishmen. They view themselves as Americans. And so I'll say it's during this uh, Continental Congress that you see a bit of a turning point. It's a little bit of a turning point. So is Parliament a colonial aggressor or are the colonists the aggressor? Well, it depends, I guess, on who you're talking to and your point of view. So I'm going to give a quick pause and then I'll come back. Um, we'll talk about Parliament as a colonial aggressor. <laughs> 